We're in a series entitled Legacy of Blessing, looking at the stories of Abram and Sarah. It comes on the heels of a series last year. We were looking at the first 10 chapters of Genesis, the universal history of the world, asking and trying to answer in the midst of a cultural crisis of meaning, who am I, what am I, and why am I here? We noted that the first 10 chapters of Genesis are very well suited to answer what am I, what does it mean to be human, and also why am I here, what does it mean to have godly work as image bearers of our Lord. But it's interesting as the narrative in Genesis continues on in these genealogies, it narrows in and gets more specific about the line of Abraham and Sarah. And it's interesting to think about that, answering more closely the question, who am I? This question of identity. And as we seek to see our own stories grafted into this great tree, that the stories of the patriarchs are actually our stories too, because you learned it in Sunday school, didn't you? When you sang the song, Father Abraham has many sons, I am one of them, and so so are you. So as we ask this question, consider what it means to have ancestors and legacy and how our stories fit with their stories. We need to consider whether or not our culture has strong enough hero stories. Who are your heroes and how do they inform your actions? Several weeks ago when I opened up the series, we talked about, I showed you a mock interview that I found in a book called Take Back Your Family. A mock interview from a little boy from the first century Palestine, a little Jewish boy, comparing and contrasting his answers with a modern kid named Brad from Atlanta. I'd like to zoom in a little bit on that interview and hopefully help us see the contrast a little bit culturally as we consider these questions. So to review a little bit, two interviews. The first is Yitzhak, son of Asa, and remember the It's first century, around A.D. 33, and we're also going to talk a little bit to Brad Johnson, Atlanta, Georgia, A.D. 2021. Interview goes like this, Yitzhak, please describe your family, and you're going to notice that he immediately mentions his ancestors, and he'll also talk about heroic deeds in his family line. We are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from the tribe of Judah in the line of Yahab who led our family in the war against the Greeks 200 years ago. Please, Brad, describe your family. Well, my parents are nice, but a little strict. My sister is totally annoying. My mom helps me with my homework, and my dad helps coach my little league team in the spring. It's not a problematic answer, but we note that he does not mention his ancestors, his extended family, any of that. So it's just a difference that you can see depicted in their answers. Uh, To drill down a little bit more, Yitzhak, let's ask a follow-up question. Who are your heroes? My biggest hero is Yahab. We still have his sword and shield hanging in our home, and my grandfather tells us stories about him and other ancestors of of our clan every Shabbat. Brad, who are your heroes? I guess a few of the baseball players on the Braves are pretty cool. Again, not a problematic response. And we could say, well, the author of the book isn't being very fair. You could have picked a kid that would mention his ancestors, perhaps his Sunday school heroes, etc. So we won't we won't be too hard on Brad. Rather, we could be a little bit we could be a little bit hard on Danny Blosser, seventh grade. That's me, in case you were wondering who that is. Danny Blosser, seventh grade. And if you'd asked me who my heroes were, I might have come up with my grandparents or maybe thought about some of my Sunday school heroes from the Bible, but probably I was going to say Michael Jordan. Let's be honest. It was the 90s. It was the 90s. And if you looked at the art in my room and you saw the great big poster of Michael Jordan just flying through the air, you would understand something about my seventh grade heart. If you asked me what shoes were cool, I would have said the Air Jordan tennis shoe, which I had no hope of ever owning, but the cool kids did. The cool kids did. 
And so what we have to ask and answer is, do we have strong enough heroes in American culture? Have they captured our hearts and our minds and our imaginations? Because it is from this well of story that we will gain courage for our tasks. They will order our priorities and instruct our behaviors. Thankfully, I mean, I like Michael Jordan still, but thankfully I, over the years, have kind of grown up and traded up for some better heroes. One in college that I can still remember the day and where I was when I heard that one of my heroes had died. My hero was Rich Mullins, songwriter, singer that we like to listen to as a family, sang songs about the faith. And he had died. And as I was thinking about this, this message and putting together this, 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 this talk on this particular passage, I was thinking about this. And I thought it would be actually helpful to share with you one of Rich's songs as he riffs on the hero stories that are his stories as a Christian, as he thinks about his Lord and Savior and the possibility that he might have grown up in kind of a similar way in different times and different places, but particularly that they both heard the same hero stories from the Bible, that Rich Mullins would share hero stories with Jesus Christ and that they would inform his life as a mature believer is what this song is about. This song is biographical, and it's going to go back and forth between Rich Mullins and Jesus Christ. It goes like this. Please don't sing along. Some of you will love this song. Please don't sing along. It goes like this. You was a baby like I once, referring to the Lord. You was a baby You was a baby like I was once. You was crying in the early morning. You was born in a stable, Lord. Reed Memorial is where I was born. They wrapped you in swaddling clothes. Me, they dressed in baby blue. Well, I was 12 years old in the meeting house listening to the old men pray. Well, I was trying hard to figure out what it was they was trying to say. There you were in the temple. They said you weren't enough, you weren't old enough to know the things you knew. Hmm. Well, did did you grow up hungry? Did did you grow up fast? Did the little girls giggle when you walked past? Did you wonder it was that what it was that made them laugh? And did they tell you stories about the saints of old, stories about their faith? They say stories like that make a boy grow bold. Stories like that make a man walk straight. And you was a boy like I was once, but was you a boy like me? Well, I grew up around Indiana. You grew up around Galilee. And if ever really, and if I ever really do grow up, Lord, I want to grow up and be just like you. Well, did you wrestle with a dog and lick his nose? Did you play beneath the spray of a water hose? Did you ever make angels in the winter snow? And did they tell you stories about the saints of old, stories about their faith? They say stories like that make a boy grow bold. Stories like that make a man walk straight. Did you ever get scared playing hide and seek? Did you ever try not to cry when you scraped your knee? Did you ever skip a rock across a quiet creek? And did they tell you stories about the saints of old, stories about their faith? They say stories like that make a boy grow bold. Stories like that make a man walk straight. And I really may just grow up and be like you someday. In our text this morning, we are met with, once again, with Abram. And the stories of the patriarchs are exemplars. That's how they function in a lot of ways. There's a lot of good here, and there's a lot of really bad here. And either way, they can help your faith grow up to do the good, to leave the bad, most of all, to trust the Lord above all. In this text, we meet the warrior Abram, which is kind of funny, isn't it? Because so far, we know he's an old man. He might be 90 years old by now. He's been promised a child, but he's barren. He's walking around, and what does he really do? certainly doesn't seem like the scene from which will arise a warrior, Abram, commando of troops. But yet this is what is described, and this is 
the story that comes to us this morning in Genesis chapter 14, the second episode in the trilogy of Abram and Lot stories. Remember the first one we talked about last week, right? They needed to separate Abram and Lot because they're starting to fight. Their servants are starting to fight. And last week we were filled with a sense of doom, perhaps, because Lot seems to be walking by sight as he picks the best land for himself. But Abram is walking by faith, trusting that the Lord will make good on his promises someday. Well, it doesn't take long before we're in this text. And sure enough, though that real estate looked good, Lot is in a pickle right away. As these warring kings, these tribes ally east versus west and come and have these skirmishes and these battles. And guess what? Lot is kidnapped in all of this mess. Oh, you're ready for a story now. You're ready for a story now. What? Lot's been kidnapped? What's going to happen? What is going to happen? So we come to this outline, and you can follow this along. If you have this on the back of your bulletin, you can fill it in if you want. But the first scene of this text is Abram the warrior. Abram the lawyer. And we see that Lot's been abducted, and we wonder how this is going to resolve Lot, or sorry, Abram hears that his nephew has been abducted and goes into action. Goes into action to save his nephew. Lot's been separated from him, but the blessing will continue as Lot is rescued by Abram. He gets intel. He musters the militia, his militia, which is surprising. How does this shepherd have fighting men? 300 fighting men. By now, the group of people that serve him has grown, and he has people who are able to to fight in his group. But we shouldn't think all of a sudden that Abram is strong and mighty. In fact, this low number of troops versus all these kings should give us a sense of doom. Really? This is an underdog story. A 90-year-old with, well, okay, 300 fighting men, he's going to go up against a confederation of kings. How is this going to work out? Well, sure enough, he musters this militia. He chases these king, this kings all the way out, all the way to Damascus. He recovers Lot and his possession. Mission accomplished. What a story. And this story foreshadows another type of conquest. The conquest story of the nation of Israel going into the, the land of Canaan and pushing out as a matter of judgment the inhabitants there, the Canaanites. So use your imagination for a second, wondering, you're on the eve of battle, you're going to have to go up against Canaanites with their fortified cities and their their giants and their vast numbers. You've never fought before. You've been wandering around the desert growing up. How will you gain courage to go and do the Lord's will in this land? It's not a stretch to think that they're going to tell you stories about Abram, stories about his faith, stories that will make you walk bold and straight into battle because we see that he is outnumbered and that he is old. But Dad, Joshua's old. You know, he's got to be 80 or 90 years old. Well, yep, that's right, son, but remember, Father Abram, Father Abraham, probably 90 years old when he chased those kings all the way to Damascus, put on your sword, It's time to go. So it foreshadows Israel's conquest of Canaan. But more importantly, this rescue foreshadows the great rescue of our Lord from our sins, doesn't it? And we're going to get more into that in a few moments in this sermon. I'm going to just tease you right there with a little bit of foreshadowing. So we see Abram in the first act as Abram the warrior. And you might expect him, you know, at the end of this victory to come sort of swaggering in, kind of sauntering about, you know, I'm large and proud. Look what I did. I chased them all the way out. But in the next act, what we see instead is Abram the meek. Now, Pastor Dan, why did you choose the word meek? Meek is weak. It's a lame word. It makes us think of people who don't fight, but of people who immediately go belly up. Cowards, people who are meek, who don't fight. That's not what the word means. 
And if you study the word and drill down on its biblical meaning, it has to do with power under control. Moses, the great leader of the children of Israel, is considered to be a meek man. It's the opposite of proud. It's humility. It is rightly ordered life, knowing where you fit in the world. It used to be that when we were trying to teach people chivalry, one of the definitions of chivalry, being a, a knight or a lady, it was particularly on the knight side of things, is, is mighty in battle and meek in hall. Mighty in battle and meek in hall. What does that mean? Well, you can think of Lord Aragorn, the king. A terror on the battlefield. Yet when he comes to hall, does he look like a bloody mess? Drooling out his mouth? Cussing and carrying on? No. He is so fine. He is so smooth. He is in the richest garments. He, the ladies, notice, don't they? Because not only is he mighty in battle, he is meek in hall. He has a humility that will allow him to bow down even to hobbits. And now what we meet here is Abram the meek. Abram, the victorious, mighty warrior, and, and the, the text is going to put us in a scene where he meets two kings. Interesting. How will it play out? First, he meets Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Let's look at the text together. After his return from the defeat of, yeah, that's hard to say, Kedorlamer, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, verse 19. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So first we meet Melchizedek, king of Salem. His name means king of righteousness. But we also see that he's called the king of Salem. Salem is very close to Shalom. He is the king of peace. But you also can note that the, the very, very important city is called Jerusalem. Salem on the end of Jerusalem. Many scholars believe, and I'm with them, that that. He was the king of ancient Jerusalem, king of righteousness, king of Salem, the king of peace, the king of Jerusalem. We also note, and this is the first place in the Bible where the term priest occurs. He's not only a king, but he is a priest and will speak on behalf of God Most High, blessing Abraham. What does he do? We note that he brings out bread and wine, the symbols of banquet and fellowship, and he communes with Abram, the one who has a covenant relationship with God. He brings banquet, but he also brings blessing and says, blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And what is his point? What's his point? Hail the conquering hero, Abram, how awesome you are. No. What's his point? Blessed be God most high. For who gave such an underdog, such a mighty victory to recover his nephew but God most high? And where does blessing come from if not from God most high? Abram, you're not that great, no offense. But you walk by faith and fight by faith with a God who is so much bigger. The New Testament interpretation of this man is that he is a type of Christ. And again, I'm teasing you. We're going to get into that in a moment. But notice Abram's response is one of meekness. He acknowledges the blessing and acknowledges the symbols of banquet and fellowship and acknowledges the superiority of this king priest who stands for God in this text. Awesome. But then there's a second meeting. They're all there together. The king of Sodom. And the Hebrew Bible is going to give you to these two guys too in the strongest contrast possible. As awesome and as great as the king of Salem, Melchizedek, is to you, you're supposed to think, oh man, the king of Sodom. First of all, he's completely humiliated. Wasn't able to defend his home turf against a confederation of raiding kings. 
Secondly, he's humiliated because he's been rescued by this nobody who doesn't even live here, this Abram. But he does not approach Abram in humility and thanksgiving. He approaches Abram differently. Though the king of Sodom is humiliated and indebted to Abram, he approaches Abram with curt speech and greed. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord. He's taking an oath. Lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let them take their share. Interesting moment in the life of Abram. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, did contribute greatly to Abram's wealth in that particular episode that we learned from before. Here now, he doesn't want to take anything. He doesn't want the story to be that the king of Sodom made him rich. I believe, again, he's learning his lessons. His faith is growing. God has made me rich. But we also see that he is not going to respond to this curt and greedy king. Likewise, putting him in his place, putting him down. He is magnanimous. He is generous. He is God-dependent. No, take your stuff. Take your stuff. Once again, we see foreshadowing, don't we? Because the nation of Israel is in their conquest of Canaan is going to be told specifically by the Lord in certain places, don't touch the plunder. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Leave it. It's for me. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't to their great chagrin. But they ought to have remembered the story of Abraham, the story about his faith and how he generously gave up the booty and did not let this selfishness consume him. So we've looked at Abram a little bit, haven't we? The, the warrior and the meek. But this isn't about Abram. It's about his God. And it's about his great, 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 great,
Bible says in Hebrews that he's always living to make intercession for us. His priestly ministry is still going, friends, even right now today. Melchizedek generously brings bread and wine and blessing. Our Lord brings bread and wine and blessing. Abram pays a tithe to this priest king. And our Lord, our priest king, humbly receives our tithes and offerings. He is the true and better Melchizedek. So as we exalt together in our story and seek to find our story grafted into the stories of Christ and of Abram, how does that affect us today? What are some applications first some applications since we have been rescued we are exhorted by holy scripture to fight courageously aren't we we are exhorted to fight courageously by by paul who says that we're in a holy war and we're supposed to have our armor on we fight courageously against sin and death and the devil and the flesh and the world We fight against addiction and oppression. And we work shalom into the world in whatever way he calls us to. We fight courageously. We don't fight foolishly like Peter pulling out a sword and whacking people's ears off. We need a rightly ordered way to fight. Don't just get on your socials and fight against your enemies, my friends. These fights are often in the privacy of our besetting sins, working it out. In the courage that it takes to be kind to our families and to the people that irritate us. Pastor Mark has quipped before, and I think it's great. He's met plenty of men that are willing to die for their wives, but they'd rather die than do dishes. (laughs) Such a great line. Somehow it seems like, oh yeah, give me a sword, I'll go out and fight. But we don't want to fight on our knees. We don't want to fight in humble service, which is what our Lord calls us to do, each and every one of us. Fight courageously. Two, give generously. We kind of are like the greedy king of Sodom. Greed is one of the seven deadly sins. It entraps all of our hearts, and the antidote is to give generously. The Bible says, freely you have been given, therefore freely give. We we cannot be characterized by a stingy smallness, a scarcity mentality that's always scraping. We are to give generously of our time and our treasure and our talents. Very famous three T's that we like to use when preachers get on to giving. Time, treasures, Talents. Give generously, for we have been freely given. Third, bless Christianly. We've talked about Abram's mission is to be a man of blessing. He says, bless the nations. Out of this abundance of blessing that comes to him, he's supposed to spread it outwardly, generously. And this, why did I put Christianly on there? Because bless, blessing just doesn't, isn't just like, have a nice day, <laughs> good luck, sort of a, cheerful sort of sticker on things. It's an approach. It's a stance. It's something that you bring to a room. It's something you bring into a conversation. People might not remember what you say, but they're going to remember how you made them feel. And whether they walked away from their interactions with you feeling encouraged in the Lord or condemned. So we must... We must bless Christianly because the Lord is a fountain of blessing, giving us blessing to give out to others. Finally, and most importantly, if you think you're going to do all the things I just said, you think you're going to fight and give and bless on your own, forget about it. You can't do it because the first thing that has to happen is that we must receive humbly. Receive humbly. Receive humbly by the, by the act of faith the riches of the gospel coming down to you. We bow the knee, we receive these things humbly, and then we give them back to our Lord 
in faithful obedience. Now we can fight. Now we can give. Now we can bless. Because you cannot give what you don't have. So all of this starts with the heart of faith that is joined to Christ. So this morning, if I stand up here and give you a list of things to do, and I don't say first, believe in the one who is fighting for you, has rescued you from your sin, who has given you, endowed you with bread and wine, and asked you to bless the nations, then I have failed as your pastor. Christ first. Christ first. Follow Abram. To conclude. We've seen that Christ is the true and better Abram who fights our battles, rescues us from our captors, and who is humble and generous. He is the true and better Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, the king of peace, a high priest forever who gave himself for us and intercedes even now for us. As we humbly receive him by faith, We join his cause by fighting courageously, giving generously, and blessing Christianly. May you see your story as an extension of Abram's. May you see your story as an extension of Christ the righteous. And then as it comes down from there, you can see it as an extension of Rich Mullins. Or your mom or dad, or your Sunday school teacher, Or for me, yesterday, Stan Burden. What a glorious funeral here yesterday, Stan Burden. And if you're looking for better heroes, if you want to trade up your heroes from the best that American culture has to offer, go to funerals, y'all. Go to funerals. Because you'll hear tales of the word of God, the grace of God, the grace of the gospel being refracted through the stained glass of stand burden, and you will be humbled and blessed and encouraged, and you'll want to go live better. You will. It helps us all go back into our living rooms to give a kind word and a patient response. Go back into our workplace and do diligence unto the Lord with joy in our work, even if our boss is so irritating. To be kindness, to have kindness for those who are our enemies. May it be so. Lord, help us, we pray. Let us pray. Father, we don't understand your your generosity. We can't even get a glimpse of it right. But what little we can manage, we thank you and humbly receive. We pray you would multiply our offering and help us to live unto you. In the strong name of Christ, the righteous, the warrior, the king of peace, and shalom. Amen.